Hello and welcome to Chapter 6, Environmental Ethics and Economics, Values and Choices. So by the end of Chapter 6, you're going to probably want to have a pretty good understanding of uh, modern economies and how they interact with the environment, as well as an understanding of how people place their values and choices. Alright, let's look at culture and worldview. So someone's culture and their understanding of their place in the world and everyone else's place in the world can greatly affect how they view certain environmental situations. So if we look down here, say a mining corporation moves into a small native village and they set up a big mining site and they start mining for certain minerals. While well, that certain mining corporation might see it as only an economic gain, uh, the native people that are being displaced might see it as just complete and utter destruction of their land. Okay, now let's look at environmental ethics. So first, let's take a look at instrumental value. So an instrumental value is essentially a value that is, has like a very demonstrated practical worth. So you can think about it as, say somebody values an animal for the food that that animal could provide. So say that animal was hunted and killed or raised and slaughtered, um, that animal would provide a certain amount of food and that's why it's valuable. Comparatively, an intrinsic value is something that has a value within itself. So say that same animal that was valued for food above is now valued because they're a living being and they deserve to be valued as a, as a living being, essentially. Alright, now let's look at the distinction, the distinction excuse me, between affluent in the environment and the poor in the environment. So basically in this section of the book, the difference they're trying to uh, draw a connection between is that the poor are not as readily able to move towards sustainability and green technology even if they wanted to because inherently at this point... Um, that costs a lot of money, and that's an investment that these certain communities aren't able to make yet. Okay, now let's move uh, into these three concepts here. So, anthropocentrism. That's basically the concept that uh, the human is the center of the environment. So, someone who believes uh, this mindset denies the idea that any non-human holds any intrinsic value. So, essentially, they're only interested in benefiting people. Comparatively, uh, biocentrism looks more towards the holistic impact on all living things. So they believe there's an intrinsic value in all living things and that the overall impact on all things should be valued. And now here at the bottom, ecocentrism uh, basically values the wellness of an entire community in an ecosystem, not solely an individual. So it hopes that by protecting an entire community that not uh, only one organism is safeguarded. All right, now let's look at conservationist roots. So uh, some of the early earliest uh, conservationists were people such as like the transcendentalists. So think of like Thoreau, Emerson, Whitman. They basically put uh, a divine value on nature. Uh, it then moved into John Muir, who is a huge, huge deal in environmental studies. So basically he uh, came up with the uh, concept of preservation. So what preservation basically stands for is that uh, we should leave nature completely unharmed by humans. So that's like a basically, uh, we can use the term we just learned, that's an ecocentrist uh, mindset, basically. So instead of using resources, we should just let nature be. That's basically what Muir believed. Uh, Gifford Pinchot, on the other hand, believed in a concept known as conservation. And conservation basically stands for that we must conserve our usage of the environment. So we're allowed to use resources from the environment as long as we use them sparingly. Uh, and we can use another term we just learned. That's uh, the anthropocentric uh, mindset. All right, now let's go down here and look at Aldo Leopold. So uh, in environmental studies, he's kind of known for having a very well-rounded view. He kind of molds the ideas of preservation and conservation, and uh, his views in the environment are very neutral, but uh, very well-rounded, and he's very valued. All right, so now let's get into economies. So uh, it's important to have a general understanding of a bunch of different types of economies because once we get into later topics such as a carbon tax or a cap and trade system, it's uh, important to have a backbone understanding of how econ uh, economies work, basically. All right, so let's look at uh, these major ones. So a substance economy is pretty self-explanatory. It's basically an economy that meets all of its own needs. So it doesn't really trade that much with other countries. They provide for themselves. Uh, a capitalist market economy is basically based on interactions between buyers and sellers. And then a centrally, pl a centrally planned economy, excuse me, is completely government run and regulated. Uh, and granted, most major world economies have what's called a mixed economy, which is somewhere in between all three. Uh, nobody really has a fully capitalist or a fully central planned economy really anymore. All right, now let's look at neoclassical economies and the environment. So here we have four pretty main uh, neoclassical economic principles 
And there are some gaps between uh, those principles and environmental sustainability, and those are the gaps we're going to kind of look for here. So let's start off with uh, resources are infinite and interchangeable. That's a neoclassical uh, economy policy. Um, but this is not inherently true with natural resources. So if you look at something with like fossil fuels, that's a very finite resource. And yes, it needs to be interchanged here, but uh, that's not really what this uh, policy is talking about. Um, so it's not, it doesn't really fit into current environmental issues because really uh, when you're looking at natural resources, they really aren't infinite. Now let's look at cost and benefits. Uh, cost and benefits are internal. So uh, again, when looking at environmental studies, this isn't entirely true because if you look at something known as an external cost, then this is flawed. So an external cost is basically, think of something that neither the consumer nor the producer pays for. So say uh, the factory is producing shoes over at Nike. Um, the uh, manufacturer is paying for the materials, they're making the shoes, they're paying the workers, and then it gets sent over, the consumer is buying the shoes. However, there's a gap. So the pollution caused by that factory per se, that's an external cost that no one's paying for, but it's hurting the environment and it's hurting everyone. And so uh, this policy doesn't really fit into the concept of external costs. Now let's look at the concept that future effects of uh, discounting. So basically what that's saying is that uh, the policy itself is uh, basically putting incentives on working quickly in the present. So it's not really looking forward until what the effects of uh, working at a very quick rate at a, in a present day. So the problem with this is that it does not foresee long-term effects. And when you're looking at environmental issues, uh, long-term effects are really important. So say um, there's an incentive to cut down as many trees as you can because the market value on timber is really high right now. The problem with that is it doesn't really foresee the long-term effects of cutting down all those trees. Uh, now let's look at economic growth is always good. Uh, when you're looking at that, that sounds appealing and that sounds like a good economic policy, but again, it's not always actually good. This uh, economic growth is always good. This principle has kind of led to a concept known as affluenza, which is basically everyone be becoming obsessed with material goods. And uh, as affluenza spreads, uh, there's a depletion of natural resources. And as the rest of the world progresses, and instead of just having a few really advanced countries, the rest of the entire world begins to uh, move forward into new technologies, um, economy, uh, economic growth, excuse me, isn't always that good because we can't support that amount of resources. All right, now let's look at environmental economists. Um, so basically what these people do is they believe that we need to become more efficient if uh, the population continues to grow, which it will. Uh, and they came up with something known as steady state economics, which is basically instead of uh, being so focused on economic growth, it basically focuses on stabilizing the economy and um, making sure that we can sustain our uh, population and everything. Okay, now let's look at something uh, known as measuring economic progress. So we're all probably familiar with something known as GDP, gross domestic product. So basically GDP measures total monetary values for say a country in one entire year. So you can see this table down here. So that's granted a very, very high number if you're looking at like the GDP of the United States or something. However, the problem with the GDP is that it doesn't take into account negative economic surges. So say crime, for example, or prisons. Um, environmental scientists came up with something known as the GPI, or the Genuine Progress Indicator. So basically the difference between these two is that the GPI picks up the slack that's, that the uh, GDP left off. So the GPI basically accounts for positive and negative economic trends. So it adds in volunteer work and other things that don't really have an economic value and it subtracts negative impacts such as crime and pollution. Okay, now let's look at ecosystem goods and services. So we uh, discussed ecosystem services in other chapters, but an important thing to note is that ecosystem services are said to have non-market values. So think of pollination, for instance. There isn't really a uh, economic price or a price market price put on pollination because it's a natural cycle. So no one's really paying for it. So something that uh, was invented basically is something known as a continue, contingent valuation. And basically these aim to figure out how much people are willing to pay to conserve, conserve such services. Because if pollination stops, even though no one's paying for it, there will be very, very strong negative um, economic consequences. All right, so now let's look at eco-labeling and sustainable corporations. 
So basically what eco-labeling does is it gives a consumer the information that they can use to incentivize manufacturers to be economically friendly. So think of something uh, known as fair trade. You've probably seen that in supermarkets. Basically, eco-labeling lets consumers know which uh, certain brands and products are using sustainable and uh, environmentally friendly methods. Uh, another thing to look at is uh, main corporations and big corporations uh, starting to use recycling and green roof techniques, as you can see down here, to become more environmentally friendly and conscious. So major corporations are starting to do this, and we can really start seeing that change, which is good. All right, now let's look at the conclusion. So basically, this chapter... Uh, you should have a good understanding of environmental ethics and economic policies. And uh, from there, you should also learn about the gap between current economic policies and future s sustainability and uh, what we really need to do to figure things out. All right, so in Chapter 7, uh, we're going to get into environmental policy, decision-making, and problem-solving. All right, that concludes this video, and I will see you next time.